welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom, the best the king has to offer. Today's topic is the value of a kingdom inheritance. The real issue concerning the Christian lifestyle on earth does not hinge on how well you start, but whether you finish the job, as God did when he rested on the Sabbath. The issue is not just how well you are doing as a Christian. The issue is finishing. Are you a finisher? When you fall into sin, do you get up and get back in the race so you can finish strong and enjoy all the rights and privileges of your kingdom inheritance? In Psalm chapter 16, verses 4 and 5, David said this concerning his inheritance in God's eternal kingdom. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. At the beginning of this psalm, David declares his resolution to have no fellowship with the works of darkness. He repeats the awe-inspiring choice he had made of God for his portion and happiness, takes to himself the comfort of the choice, and gives God the glory for it. Today, many Christians embrace the world for their chief desires and place their happiness in the enjoyments of it. But no matter how poor your condition is in the world, because you have the love and favor of God and are accepted of him, you have a value that is only assigned to those who finish strong and are rewarded an inheritance in God's kingdom. Heaven is an inheritance. We must take that for our home, our rest, our everlasting good, and look upon this world to be no more than our sojourn in a country through which the godly road leads to our Father's house. Those that have God for their portion have a good inheritance. I'm convinced that many believers do not know or understand the value of their kingdom inheritance, which is the reward granted to faithful believers who live their life on earth Christ-like and who enjoy all the rights and benefits of the King. Christians must understand the value of the kingdom. Our inheritance in the kingdom will be determined by the degree of faithfulness with which we serve the king here and now. Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines value, as it relates to today's topic, as relative worth, utility or importance, to estimate or assign the monetary worth of, appraise, to rate or scale in usefulness, importance or general worth, evaluate to consider or rate highly, prize and esteem. The invisible kingdom of God is being expressed by Christ's body, the church. But upon Jesus' return, it will be made visible and Jesus will reign over the whole earth. Our calling and service now are preparing us to reign with him during his millennial reign when the government will be upon his shoulder. Right now, born-again believers, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, do not experience all of our inheritance rights and benefits. But at Jesus' return, when he sets up his judgment seat to evaluate kingdom-level work done by the believer, he will determine what value to place on your kingdom inheritance. Kingdom inheritance means more than just making it to heaven. It means ownership. There is something in God's will, Jesus' testament, that has been left to you. Hebrews chapter 4 is an excellent dissertation of how born-again believers can fail to enter into the rest of the inheritance of the kingdom because it is predicated on understanding the Old Testament experience of Israel and Egypt. Let me give you a brief history lesson. Israel was in bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt. This analogy corresponds to our being in bondage to sin today. God used Moses to set Israel free from slavery by use of the blood of the Passover lamb. In like manner, the born-again believer is set free by the blood of Jesus and is free to leave his sin behind, just as the Jews were free to leave Egypt. But on their way from Egypt to Canaan, Israel's promised land, Israel had to cross the wilderness. And instead of crossing the wilderness to Canaan, they murmured and complained and ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years, and it cost them their full inheritance. Now, the wilderness represents carnal Christians who wander around, unsettled, not having arrived at their divine destination. 
The generation that came out of Egypt with Moses did not receive their inheritance because they stayed in a state of unbelief and carnality in the wilderness. So we must assume Egypt as representing the unsaved world. The wilderness as the place of carnality for Christians where they wander, never living up to their spiritual potential. And Canaan as the experience of mature spiritual Christians who are spirit-filled and are where God has ordained them to be. You see, born-again believers can't hang out in the wilderness without slipping back into a lifestyle of sin. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. The key word in that verse is rest. Rest is when the Jews entered Canaan and took ownership of their inheritance. God's rest was the full realization of his inheritance. However, they became hardened by their sin and disobedience. They angered God, and he swore they would never enter his rest. In other words, they would never enter into the fullness of their inheritance. We are warned today not to allow a spirit of unbelief and disobedience to keep us from the rest of God, our full inheritance, never understanding the value of our kingdom inheritance. We must learn to appraise, evaluate, prize, and esteem our kingdom inheritance. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 11 through 19, to get a clearer understanding of what it means to allow unbelief and disobedience to keep us from our kingdom inheritance. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. During his earthly sojourn, the spiritually mature believer learns the value of a kingdom inheritance, and he learns to value his own kingdom inheritance because he doesn't want to fall short of it. He knows it is possible to fail to gain that inheritance and miss out on the full enjoyment of what God has for him. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The good news of the gospel of salvation is preached to us today, but the good news of inheriting Canaan is what was preached to the Israelites. They were told that Canaan was a land flowing with milk and honey. Plus, Moses sent spies into the land who brought back some of the incredible fruit that was in the land. But through unbelief, the majority of the spies said that there were too many giants and the cities were too fortified. And the people sided with the majority report and refused to believe that God could give them the land that he had promised. So God judged them, and the Israelites turned back into the wilderness and wandered until everyone over 20 years old had died except the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who brought back the good report that said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. So Hebrews 4.2 means that the people did not profit from the good news of the inheritance because they failed to respond in faith to the promise, and they forfeited what they had already been ordained to get. Like the Israelites, born-again believers today can forfeit their kingdom inheritance if we don't mix our faith with the promises of God. As I said at the beginning of this podcast, the real issue concerning the Christian lifestyle on earth does not hinge on how well you start, but whether you finish the job. God has a plan for your life that he wants you to complete. You must keep your eyes on the prize, your kingdom inheritance. Your kingdom inheritance is a reward. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 4 verses 3 through 11 for a review of why the Israelites failed to enter God's rest, their inheritance in the promised land. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, 
they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We must give due diligence that we may have a clear entrance into the kingdom of God. As God finished his work and then rested from it, so he will cause those who believe to finish their work and then to enjoy their rest. It is evident that there is a more spiritual and excellent Sabbath remaining for the people of God than that of the seventh day, or that into which Joshua led the Israelites. The rest is a rest of grace and comfort and holiness and a rest in glory where we enjoy the end of our faith and the object of all our desires. The Sabbath rest, which remains to be enjoyed, is undoubtedly the heavenly rest, which remains to those of us who maintain our faith in the promises of God and are opposed to a life of labor and trouble. It is the rest we shall obtain when Jesus returns to reign as king over the nations. But those who do not believe shall never enter into this spiritual rest, because God has always declared man's rest to be in him his love to be the only real happiness of the soul, and faith in his promises to be the only way of entering that rest. The kingdom inheritance consists of rest, spiritual and eternal, the rest of grace here and now, and glory hereafter. Our rest is in Christ on earth and with Christ in heaven. After diligent labor for the kingdom of God, sweet and satisfying rest shall follow, and your labor now will make that rest more pleasant when it comes. Let us labor to be diligent in our faith to enter that rest. The example of disobedience was Israel. We are urged today to finish our course, fulfill our divine assignment, so we can share God's rest with him. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23-24 validates this understanding of our kingdom inheritance and how to enter it. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Whatever work we do needs to be done for the Lord rather than man, because he's the one who holds our inheritance. And so we must live to please God rather than trying to please people. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus, whose blood seals the New Testament will, which contain the promises that lead to our kingdom inheritance. If you and I are going to get all that God has for us in this life and become owners in the kingdom in the next life, it will be because God gave us our inheritance, which you can only get if you finish the course and which you must do by faithful obedience to God and the promises that are in his word. If the inheritance is a reward for faithful service to Christ, then there must come a day of evaluation when what we have done will be tested. That day will be at the judgment seat of Christ, the standard that Jesus will use to evaluate our diligent service and therefore our inheritance is the infallible standard of his word. Only the word of God can penetrate and judge motives. How do we meet the standard? We have a great high priest. Let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points 
tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Holy Scriptures are the Word of God. The Word, by God's Spirit, convinces powerfully, converts powerfully, and comforts powerfully. It makes a proud soul to be humble and a perverse spirit to be meek and obedient. Sinful habits that become natural to the soul and rooted deeply in it are separated and cut off by this sword of the Spirit. The Word of God discerns the thoughts and purposes, the vileness of man, and the bad principles of sin that moves them to act on it. The Word of God will show the sinner all that is in his heart. Let us hold fast the doctrines of Christian faith in our heads, its enlivening principles in our hearts, the open profession of it in our lips, and be subject to it in our lives. Christ executed one part of his priesthood on earth by dying for us. The other part of his priesthood he executes in heaven, pleading our cause and presenting our offering to God. In the sight of infinite wisdom, it was needful that the Savior of men should have actual experience of all the effects of sin that could be separated from its actual guilt. God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh so that he would have a deeper impression of its evil. And so he is concerned the more to deliver his people from its guilt and power. We should encourage ourselves by the excellence of our high priest to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need. Mercy and grace are the things we want. Mercy to pardon all our sins and grace to purify our souls. Besides our daily dependence upon God for present supplies, we are to come with reverence and godly fear before his throne, not as if dragged to the seat of justice, but as kindly invited to the mercy seat where grace reigns. We have boldness to enter into the holiest only by the blood of Jesus. He is our advocate and has purchased all our souls want or can desire. Throne means he's the king. Grace means he's a benevolent dictator. Throne means he's sovereign. Grace means he cares. Throne means he can do anything. Grace means he wants to do something. Jesus Christ has provided you with all the grace you need to finish your race and receive your full inheritance. He paid it all so you can have bold and full access to God's throne. It is through his grace that you can finish strong and win the prize of your kingdom inheritance. Like Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, you will be able to say as well, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I submit to you that the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to you on that day is your kingdom inheritance, and you will know and understand its value. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share. And subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.